Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 213, March Gamer Madness, part two. We'd like to thank all our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast with board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to round two of our March Gamer Madness. This is the second and third round in which we will be battling out the best games from the best era in board gaming. So we're so glad to have you back. Hopefully you've listened previously to part one of March Gamer Madness. If you haven't, please jump back to episode 212 because... Some of this will be a lot clearer if you hear our first kind of battling through, especially with the descriptions for the game. So we're so glad to have you for this second and third round. And as always, I have with me my co-host, Anthony. How are you doing, my friend? Doing good, doing good. Ready to get down to some board game matchups. It's funny because this morning, the day we're recording this, I went through the actual March Madness brackets and while I was doing that, I kept getting distracted, being like, what? Wait, what games are we at here? The R bracket? And I was like, focus, focus. <laughs> uh, it's been a few years. My school's actually in that tournament. So I have to pay attention this time. Ah, OK. Yeah, there is a lot of battling out. And if you haven't been involved in the madness so much, here we take two fantastic games. And in particular, for this madness competition, we're looking at the best historic era for games so we are going through all these different historic eras and hopefully coming out with the best games for those particular eras match them up fight them down see where they're not just thematic but where their gameplay actually matches and represents that particular era we're going to be going through ancient medieval early modern period and late modern and if you do like these bracket matchups Don't forget, we do these every year. So there's different matchups on our past feeds. Please jump back, see those matchups, and maybe you'll find something that's even more engaging for you. Once again, thank you all for joining us for this episode. A special shout out to our Patreon packers for helping us make this all possible. And like we do with every episode, we have our special Patreon backer contest where each and every week, one of our Patreon backers at the producer level wins a game. So, Anthony, how are we doing this week with our contest? Yep. Yeah. Another week, another game given away. Uh, Last week, Andrew was the winner. He picked Root, which is on its way to him as we speak. This week's winner is Evan. Evan has been a backer now for six months, so been on board for a little bit now. Thank you to everybody who's a Patreon backer, of course. This is why we do this. It's a great way to get everybody involved, but it's also just a cool way to give back. And uh, we are now on week six of this, and it's, it's just really cool to finally be into it and be able to do it and have more people jumping on board and to be able to see some of the games people are getting to the table. If you're interested in winning a game, games are pretty good. You can hit us up uh, on Patreon, patreon.com slash BGA. And uh, you could take home uh, a game. You have a chance at it every single week. And it's a pretty good chance because while the numbers are growing, it's still, you know, a a rather modest pool of people against which to compete every week. All right. So if you'd like to join us with that, please check us out on Patreon.com backslash bga and at the producer level you are automatically joined for the contest so if you're currently if you're currently at the one dollar level please jump up so you can join the fun and for everyone else out there there is so much great bga content on patreon so if you'd like to hear more about our back episodes you can jump on there we do special patreon episodes just for patreon backers obviously our slack group and a whole bunch of different add-ons at your particular level on patreon So once again, thanks so much. We really appreciate you supporting us and we hope to get more BGA goodness out to you. All right, Anthony. So we're getting into the contest. This is where the stuff gets really good. So let's get on to round two. All right, let's do it. All right. So for round two, we are jumping back into the ancient era of gaming games that best represent those eras. We had some really, really hard, hard competitions in that first round. Now we're on to the second round and first up in the number one seed is the big baddie of them all. Seven wonders versus the newcomer, the number nine game, Tetawakin. 
Anthony, this is an early game that's absolutely positively crushing me. What do you think? Yeah, man, I <laughs> I guess it won't be a surprise which of these games I like best. But stepping back and thinking about it thematically, I also think Teotihuacan is a better choice here. Now, Seven Wonders is amazing. It's an amazing game. I love it. It covers all these different ancient civilizations that you can choose from. It has the different leaders in there. If you have the expansions and all this different stuff that you can add into it to really give you more thematic flavor. But Teotihuacan, it, as a Euro, just really kind of has all these different, you have these temple tracks, you have the pyramid, which you're actually building. You have all this artwork and little bits and pieces. Like you look closely at the board, you can see the little people going about their business. Yeah, it's a Euro. It's kind of abstracted, but Seven Wonders is a card game. So, if, you know, I don't, I don't know that any of these are perfectly good at representing the mechanics of the time, unless it's a war game. So for me, Teotihuacan feels more like I'm in that era, t- participating, learning, whatever it is. Uh, and that's, that's the one I pick. This is really hard competition for me because, as you mentioned, Tetuacan obviously is more or less period specific, obviously with the resources and especially with the building of the pyramid. Actually having a game where you're physically brick by brick building the pyramid is fantastic and really does represent the era really well. Seven Wonders, as you mentioned, if you add the expansions to it, and I'm not really sure, we haven't really clarified this too much, but if you add the expansions to it, you're talking about historical figures with the leaders. Obviously, you can be building the Tower of Babel, which is very similar to what Teotihuacan does with the pyramid. Then you have more of a building element to it. It's actually a very hard decision for me here. I think why Seven Wonders kind of pushes a little bit further is because you do have all the different civilizations represented on the different player boards and obviously the cards and the different generations, how they kind of like start from very basic resources up to more advanced resources to up to to more advanced technologies. This is a really tough first round pick, but I'm going to go with Seven Wonders which means it goes on to our listeners, Anthony. What do they have to say? Yeah, so we mentioned this last week, but just in case you skipped ahead, uh, we had a contest that we ran for a couple weeks ahead of this, and we had nearly 200 people entered and chose who they thought would win out. They went through all 63 matchups and they gave their, their picks. And so what we did is we tallied that up and used that data also for this. So whoever gets closest in the end is going to win a game, but also it helps tell us which games you guys think are best in each of these rounds. So... We have that data, and I have it here in front of me, the reference uh, as the tiebreakers. So it's always kind of a fun thing. You guys get to split the vote, as it were. So on this one, this first one, it was actually fairly close. I think we have Seven Wonders, the behemoth. It's been out for several years, and Teotihuacan, which is kind of the hotness. Uh, But Seven Wonders did get a decent number uh, of more votes than Teotihuacan. So um, that's the tiebreaker. All right, so our number one seed, Seven Wonders, moves on to the next round. Next up, we have our number two seed, Concordia, versus our number 10 seed, Innis. So once again, we're talking about ancient Celtic traditions versus more of the trading in the Mediterranean, Anthony. So what do you have? I know, yeah. And like a lot of these that are still left are trading in the Mediterranean. True. So it's it's tough. Uh, Concordia, it's, I said this last time, but you have several different maps, several different mechanics that come in because of that. And it really just, you get different feels for different parts of that era which is pretty cool and it's i like this one and the reason i picked it last time is that it's different right it's a different era celtic history is not something that comes up a lot in games especially like to this level including the theme and the artwork and everything else i think of the two the one that i again the same way i broke up the first one when i picked is the one that just makes me feel more part of what i'm doing concordia is more of the same it's more trading in the mediterranean and is just so unique and just colorful and different. And that's why I'm going to go with Innis on this one. Again, this is another really tough matchup. Concordia trading the Mediterranean. The maps are fantastic. The resources look great. Having the opportunity to explore is tremendous. Innis has, I got to say, one of, if not the best artworks in board gaming that represents the Celtic culture. It's just something to behold. If you haven't seen Innis, regardless of whether you're into Euro games or not, you owe it to yourself to check out this artwork. It's on all the cards. The board is fantastic. It's all about these different clans battling and out, so to speak, and worshiping the gods and such. You know, I am a 
bigger fan of Concordia, at least as far as the board game's concerned, but I can't ignore the cultural artifact of the artwork in Innis. So I'm going to go with Innis, Anthony. So that means All right. that means Innis, our number 10 seed in a massive upset, moves on to the next round. Next up, we have our number 14 seed, Antique 2, versus our number 11 seed, Command and Colors, Ancients. What do you got here, Anthony? It's all about battling. Come on. Yeah, I know, right? We can't say there's no difference in the theme and there's no difference in the era because it's both of them are just ancient, you know, Mediterranean, Rome kind of era. On one hand, you got Antique's Rondelles and this, you know, kind of very accessible, very quick playing map. And the other hand, you have uh, Richard Borg's Command and Color System, which I absolutely adore. And this is one of the best of that uh, and very well representative of that time period. I think because they're so similar on so many fronts, I'm going to go with the one that just does a little bit more on the historical front. Neither of these is like amazing on those fronts, but the one that does a little bit more because it has the cards and the different people, all the different things you're interacting with, and that's Commanding Colors, Ancients. So I'm going to go with that one. It's really a tough choice here. Both these games are fantastic, especially representing the wartime era and trying to depict it in a more or less historically accurate kind of feel. (sighs) Rough, man. Really rough. The As you mentioned, the artwork on the cards are fantastic. But you know what? I'm going to go with Antique 2. I just think it fits a little bit more as far as the bigger picture from that era. All right, Anthony. So that leads us to go to another battle off, a tiebreaker, so to speak. Our listeners will have the decision here. And which is it? Yeah. So the listeners on this one, uh, very, very close. Both of these had more or less the same number of votes overall. But in the second round here, Command & Colors ekes it out with slightly more. All right, so our number 11 pick, Command & Colors, moves on to the next round. And finally, for our ancient bracket, we have our number 13 seed, the Great Zimbabwe, versus our number 12 seed, Hannibal and Halakar. Okay, Anthony, another big matchup here of these ancient civilizations. What do you got? All right, yeah, so... I really like the Great Zimbabwe because, again, it's different. I know I keep saying that, but just something different, something unique, something to get you thinking about other areas of the world than Europe. But Hannibal and Hamilcar is an all-time classic and does such a good job of evoking that particular set of battles in that particular period in time. Just Not just like the things that are on the board and the cards are in your hand, but the mechanics really are designed to reflect that time period. So I'm going to go with Hannibal and Hamilcar because I think of all the games in this bracket remaining, it does the most to represent its historical era without being just a heavy, heavy, heavy war game. As you mentioned, really tough, good, good games. You know what? As you mentioned, it's different. It really fits a a lot of the theme of the era. I'm going to go with the great Zimbabwe, Anthony. So again, Another major clash up, a tiebreaker is needed. What do our listeners have to say? Yeah, I mean, we mentioned this last week when Antiquity lost out in the first round. And I think it's the same thing here is people just don't play a lot of splatter games. They're expensive and they're hard to find. So (laughs) Hannibal and Hamilcar got a decent number of more votes. And therefore, that's the listener. All right, our number 12 seed, Hannibal and Hamilcar, moves on to the next round. And all right, everybody. So it looks like we're going on to our medieval bracket well, Anthony, here we go. Your your favorite game of all time, our number one seed, The Voyages of Marco Polo versus our number nine seed, Shogun. Yeah, <laughs> this is a fun one. I, as you said, The Voyages of Marco Polo is one of my favorite games. It is up there. One of my top rated Euros. Shogun, though, is just so much fun. And yeah, Cube Tower, man, it's got a Cube Tower, right? <laughs> True. How many games have Cube Towers? Like, that's pretty much it yeah so, yeah and like three of them could have been in these brackets but this is the one we picked i really like both of these i kind of want to go for shogun but i just can't vote against the voyages of marco polo like you know regardless of the historical nature of either of these neither of them jumps out as having like a tremendous amount of additional historical context so i'm gonna go with voyages of marco polo again another classic matchup here dice versus cube tower and probably one of the original if not the original kind of mainstay for cube towers anthony it's all about the cube towers man i can't 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 not vote for the cube towers i'm gonna go with shogun so let's leave it up to our listeners and what do they have to say uh yeah the listeners are all about marco polo that 
so many votes. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So our number one seed, the voyages of Marco Polo, move on to the next round. Next up is our number fifteen seed, eight seven eight Vikings versus our number ten seed. Raiders of the North Sea. All right, Anthony, so where will you be raiding this season? Yeah, uh, I, I'm the one who put this bracket together this morning, like updated for this week, and I didn't realize that we had both the Viking games ended up against each other, which is apropos, I guess. So we guarantee we have a Viking game in the uh, regional semifinal. Um, it wouldn't be board gaming if we didn't have a Viking game. <laughs> Moving on to the next round. You've got to have a Viking game, right? <laughs> and there's another one later on, too. So we're going to have more Viking games. I Yeah, I mean, 878 Vikings is of these two is the one that by far has the most historical context to it. And the way it plays the asymmetry, the way you play either the English or the, the Vikings, and the just the really cool way that the Vikings invade and just slowly atrophy as they're picked at but they come in with so many men it just really does a good job of representing uh, that historical era within that system that birth of america birth of europe system that i really like so i'm gonna go with 878 vikings yeah it's hard to ignore 878 vikings the historic content the extra content that comes with the game itself to make it even more historic you can bring the churches in there and how they can be ransacked and burned down but if you do so then the people of religious faith kind of rise up. So it really does have great historic ethic to it. And beyond the epic, it also has a lot of thematic gameplay. As you mentioned, there is the defender and the attacker, and they play differently enough that it's really a different gameplay experience depending on which side of the battle you're at. I'm going to go with 878 Vikings. That means our number 15 seed, 878 Vikings, moves on to the next round. And next up is the Classic Feld, the Castles of Burgundy versus the number six seed, Twa. Yeah. All right, Anthony, so it's all about the French here. What are you feeling? Yes, I did it again. Perfect matchups all the way down. Wow. <laughs> all the French. Yeah, I mean, it, Castles of Burgundy is one of my top 10 games of all time, but I really enjoy Twa. And I feel in terms of like evoking historical periods, I like Twa a little bit more just because A, the artwork and the presentation is light years beyond Castles of Burgundy because Castles of Burgundy is a little bit of an ugly mess. Now, we're recording this before the new version comes out, so hopefully they fix that and I can go back and retcon this later. But uh, Twa is just the the way the characters come out and the, the sort of kind of integration of these different powers that you can pick up as you upgrade. And, you know, the, it's a dice game, so dice are dice. But I, I really like this one. It kind of evokes that era a little bit better. Yeah, I got to say, and I mentioned this many times on the podcast, I haven't had a lot of plays of Twa. What I have played, I really didn't care for necessarily just because basically you are buying dice that anyone can use, whereas the Castle of Burgundy dice really have a lot of different things you could do with them. So it's just a lot more fun. I have these dice. They could do all these things and they're not going to be taken away from me. So it is really rough for me here, but I will admit that Twa, with the artwork on the box, with the cards as far as the different kind of activities and things you're trying to battle against on the bottom of the board, is at least a hair more thematic than the Castles of Burgundy. So despite my intense love for the Castles of Burgundy, I'm actually going to vote for Twa here, our number six seed. Whoa, did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an upset there. Our number six seed, Twa, upsets our number three seed, the Castles of Burgundy. And somewhere there's a million voices all crying out at once <laughs> and yelling at their podcast. <laughs> all right. So finally, for our medieval bracket, we have our number four seed, A Feast for Odin, versus our number 12 seed, the Pillars of the Earth. Okay, Anthony, is it all about puzzling here or is it all about the cathedral? Huh. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, hmm. <laughs> well, I have to decide here. This bracket is just full of my favorite games. <laughs> I'll say that up front. Beast for Odin is my favorite Rosenberg game. It's probably my favorite worker placement game. It is way up there. Really love it. But I'll I'll be the first to admit thematically it's just it's a Rosenberg, so it's hey, let's make it about Vikings, I guess. Um <laughs> why not? Because you know Vikings yeah, are the out there puzzles. Well, there's boats and you're pillaging and there's the things you steal are uh, thematic and then you got to feed people and then they emigrate, which is also a thing. So, yeah, 
Um, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. That that crown is definitely that shape in real life. <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. Anyways, the Pillars of the Earth, it's tough because I feel like it it does a little bit more historically and the, the novels are full of historical value. They're just chock full of it. The game, though, is it's just a pretty, pretty basic midweight euro that doesn't other than building the cathedral and i guess the various things you need to do to get the pieces to build the cathedral <laughs> like i don't know how much this really has to do historically either it's not quite as abstracted as a feast for odin but it's definitely kind of in the middle there so it's almost a toss-up like if we were up a feast for odin up against even a slightly more thematic game it might be tougher for me i think i'm gonna stick here and just be a bit of a homer oh, um man. because you got, I got to do what i got to do I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with my vikings feast for odin all right well i'm gonna go with the pillars of the earth for every reason you mentioned previously, Anthony. <laughs> so I'm going to just say, huh? You know, and uh, kind of like an English lit major. This is eventually going to weigh down on you because the books are very thematic and there's multiple games to the collection. And building the cathedral as a time mechanic really does make you feel like the passages of time is going on. This is obviously an older game, so it doesn't have a lot of the thematic flair and the artwork of maybe a feast for Odin but it does feel like you are dealing with generations that it's taking to build up this cathedral and mining all those resources and building that fantastic structure. So I'm going to go with the pillars of the earth. So that leaves it up to our listeners. What does our listeners have to say? Yeah. So Feast for Odin's a pretty hot game. That's all I got to say about that. It's uh, it got a fair number of votes, my friend. <laughs> all right. So our number four seed, a Feast for Odin, moves on to the next round. All right, so now we're on to our early modern period, Anthony. This is going to be some of the big Euro games that hit the table each and every week. It doesn't get easier from here on out. Our number one seed, Goa, versus our number nine seed, Notre Dame. Hmm. Yeah, these are, I feel like these are pretty even, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's tough. I mean, you mentioned last week that Notre Dame, you know, with the map and everything about that and kind of how it plays out the different districts of the city. Goa, of course, obviously the, the whole different, you know, the trade routes and everything goes into mm -hmm. that. I think all things being equal, I think Notre Dame is a little bit more unique, um, not necessarily just because, you know, early modern France is early modern France, but just the way it's laid out and kind of some of the mechanics that are imbued there that people had to deal with at the time. I'm going to go with that, Notre Dame. Yeah, this is a really tough competition. Both these games are somewhat more on the abstract side, but they do give you a real feel for what's going on in the era. And obviously the trading in Goa and the auction kind of mechanic there is fantastic. It's unlike any other game out there. Notre Dame, obviously the unique landscape of the city moving through it. Obviously the cathedral, Notre Dame. And the characters and the plagues that come into the era is just fantastic. You know, this is an impossible pick, but I'm going to go with our number nine pick, Notre Dame, just because I think thematically it plays out a little more true to the era. So that means our number nine game, Notre Dame, moves on to the next round. Next up, we have our number two seed, Keyflower, versus our number seven seed, Navigador. All right, Anthony, what do you have for us? All right. Yeah. Uh, so Keyflower is just, you know, one of those all time classic games. Navigador, though, like I mentioned this last week, it's just something about that map and the way you're moving through it and the, the way the economy is kind of built into the system of the game. I mean, that's what, all what it's all about. It's about exploration, but it's really about finding those resources and, and buying and selling them at the right time. I really like Navigador for that reason. And I think this one, it's just one of the few games like this with the maps and the, the whole trading mechanism and there are millions of these games but the one that really just catches me and makes me think of that era so i'm gonna go with navigador obviously if you've ever had the opportunity to play key flower and the whole key flower series it's a fantastic game obviously it imitates a lot of the different dynamics of the era and obviously the village building and how important that was mining the resources Navigador does a little more in a little more realistic way. And even the market is probably a little more keeping with the era. So while I'm a big fan of Keyflower, I'm going to go with our number seven seed, Navigador. So our number seven seed, Navigador, moves on to the next round. Next up, our number three seed, Lorenzo El Manifico versus our number 11 seed, Raja of the Ganges. Okay, Anthony, once again, 
another dynamic game all about dice. What do you got? Yeah, yeah, we're back at it. More <laughs> dice games. Uh, it's another one of my uh, another one of my top euros here, and this is a really good matchup, I think, because Lorenzo and Rajas they're kind of they just give me similar feels when I play them. Now they're not similar really in many ways at all, but you just kind of the way you're interacting with these different things and kind of the the way it's almost like an entire you know, civilization or city state kind of laid out in front of you. I like Rajas because it's unique, it's different, and we don't get a lot of games set in these types of eras. Lorenzo, however, and it's not just because I like Lorenzo a little bit more as a game mechanically, but it does have all those leaders, right? And it tries to give you something unique and thematic for each of them. Now, it's a little abstracted, of course, but there are with the expansion and with some of the promos, there are dozens of them. And combined with the, you know, the towers of Lorenzo and Magnifico and just trying to build this whole mythology around this one individual who did live and kind of had these stories built up around him. I'm going to go with Lorenzo and Magnifico. Yeah, this is another tough competition. The dice are really fun in both these games and kind of are the lead mechanic. And they don't necessarily fit any particular market or mechanic as far as something you can go back into the air and go oh that's what they were talking about but yet again as you mentioned and i think this a little bit unfairly but because of lorenzo manifico's expansion which brings the different families that were historically accurate to that era into the game and you do feel like you are grounded within that era whereas rajas of the ganges fits really nice but it doesn't really say anything more than what you see on the board so i'm going to go with our number three seed lorenzo il manifico so that means our number three seed lorenzo manifico moves on to the next round next up we have our number 13 seed shakespeare versus our number five seed fresco somehow you did it again anthony we're all about the arts and cultures of the time yeah, right. It's uh, it's kind of a perfect representation of the two sides of art in the uh, the Renaissance. You have brilliant masterworks of Shakespeare that kind of kicked off the whole era, and then of course the 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 stained glass, the frescoes of well everywhere in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I talked about this last week. Shakespeare really, really strikes me not just as an English lit major, but as somebody who just appreciates when you can take a theme that's different. Right? It's not just it's not just the plays of Shakespeare. It's about putting on the plays of Shakespeare, right? So there's all these different characters and Shakespeare himself is a character. Um, there's writers, there's workers, there's, you know, you're building out the different parts of the set. You're getting the different, you know, the clothing and the, the props and everything you need and putting on these shows as part of the game. And it's quick and it's accessible. And it's just not a game people talk about as much as I would hope and expect. I'm going to go with Shakespeare it's not just because I like it more as a game. It's just because it's a little bit different and it just really covers an era that I wish more games were about. Yeah, I haven't seen Shakespeare at the table at all. And I know you keep mentioning how it's a fantastic game. I've been able to go through the game, at least the rule book, but I haven't got the game to the table yet. Obviously, for me, Fresco, not just because you are painting and restoring this fantastic work of art, which is the main part of the board, but every piece of the board of the player shields and the mechanics that go into actually getting your assistants and your workers up early to get to work, collecting the paint. Obviously there is multiple little queenie expansions with this game, which makes the game even more thematic, bringing in different elements like, you know, laying in gold on top of everything else. So I'm going to go with fresco here. So Anthony, we got a little bit back and forth here, probably the best, competition in this bracket so far so that means our shakespeare number 13 seed versus fresco our number five seed what do our listeners have to say yeah yeah no i mean like you said shakespeare does not hit the table a ton and uh that shows in the uh, the results here it's a reason it's a number 13 fresco got a decent number of votes people are still getting this one at the table so that's the listeners choice. all right so our number five seed fresco moves on to the next round and that is it for our early modern period now we move on to our late modern period these are some fantastic games anthony so let's get into the brackets first up our number one seed brass birmingham versus our number nine seed lewis and clark a lot of traveling here a lot of connections being made what do you feel this is surprisingly good matchup they don't seem similar but they're very good brass birmingham is like the best representation at least in euros of the industrial revolution 
writ large, right? And th this is like what Martin Wallace makes games about. He makes games about trains and factories in Europe. And it does such a good job. And this is the newest version. It's beautiful and it's amazing. But Lewis and Clark, especially as someone who grew up in the Pacific Northwest, I lived in Lewis County for six years of my life as a child. So I know a lot about these guys and we studied them in school and we lived in the area. You can go to some of the places that they, you know, that they walked through on their way. And this game has always kind of caught my imagination for that reason. And it has a lot of these characters, it has a lot of flavor text in the book and the, the different things they can do are kind of reflective of that. So even though Brass Birmingham is a much better game, in my estimate, I like Lewis and Clark for what it does in exploring that historical era, very uniquely American historical era. I'm going to go with Lewis and Clark. It's impossible not to talk about Brass Birmingham, especially right now with the reprint, how the board really represents the time and era. You do feel like you are in that era. Obviously, the transportation that you're kind of working through, making the connections. Lewis and Clark is fantastic, as, as you mentioned, having the different people that you're picking up, the traders, the travelers, the journeymen who are helping you. And when you're actually playing cards in the game, you have to pair those cards together so you actually are using a whole team and not just an individual to kind of move things along as you mentioned this doesn't seem like they're equal but it seems like an impossible pick and i don't really know what to pick here because both do such a fantastic job i think i'm going to go with and i guess i'm going to have to go with lewis and clark our number nine seed just because they take it to an extra level by representing the historical characters accurately on the cards. All right, Anthony, so our number nine seed, the biggest upset of the bracket so far, Lewis and Clark moves on to the next round. So that leaves us up to our number two seed, Lisboa, versus our number 10 seed, Clans of Caledonia. What do you have here, Anthony? Okay, yeah. Uh, so Clans of Caledonia is, it's just a really fun game, right? And it represents this era um, in Scotland, and you have these different clans, and it, it does its best to kind of represent that era and the early industrialization of the the island. And it's fun. There's a lot of games that kind of visit this theme and era, and I think this one does probably the best job of that overall, just because it's a bit bigger of a game. But Lisboa is just such a uniquely thematic experience, right? It's the way Vital Lacerda builds his games are, is just no one else can put that much theme into such a heavy Euro. It's just so hard to do. And he does it so seamlessly. And honestly, any of his games could be on this list. This is just the one that happens to be the most historic of the bunch. Right. And it just, you know, the, from the artwork representing that time to the different individuals that you kind of interact with, to the actual act of rebuilding Lisboa after all the disasters that destroyed it. I have to go with Lisboa. It's just one of those games that I just feel like I'm there part of this when i'm playing the game and very 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 few euros managed to pull i think off. for every reason that you said there it kind of stands above and beyond and clans of caledonia does a good job but that map is ridiculously abstracted and so are a lot of the mechanics there so i'm going to go with our number two seed list boa which will move on to the next round next next up we have our number three seed rococo versus our number 11 seed obsession all right anthony so here we have two very ornate and fabulous errors here, Anthony. I don't know how you did it again, but you did it here. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> with the French or the English, which side of the channel are we on? Yeah, I mean, Rococo is really good, and it's just, it, it's a beautiful game and obviously represents an era that's very unique in terms of, you know, its dedication to all this opulence, right? But Obsession is clearly an obsession for the designer, right? No pun intended, but he just clearly loves this era. Like there's so much flavor text, there's so much characterization. I keep coming back to my college degree, but having read these novels, these 19th century Victorian novels, it's it just feels like you're playing through part of one. It, it really does capture that era, I think, really well. And so and I've heard, seen multiple people online, they're like, oh, this is a theme that my wife or my husband or whoever really loves. And so this is a good game for us. I think Obsession does that best of the two. And so I'm going to go with Obsession on this one. This is really another difficult competition here. Rococo with the artwork on the board really does feel like you are involved in that lavish era where it's all about how you look, the artistry of the times, the fireworks, the different 
decorations, the music, everything that was going on there. I'm using your masters, your journeymen, being able to collect fabric and resources in order to make the best looking things possible. The gameplay is fantastic. It's just, it's one of my favorite games for so many reasons. Obsession does a tremendous job as well. The artwork on the cards and the little flavor text that comes along with them actually matches the points or negative points that you're going to get on those cards. So when you're bringing on a guest or a prestigious guest, there's going to be some challenges there. Ah, such an impossible pick. How am I supposed to pick here? I, I, I guess, you know what? I'm going to go with Obsession, our number 11 pick, just because the designer here went above and beyond. There is a whole rule book with just everything about the families and the player boards using the servants are just tremendous. Again, really, really sorry, Rico. If you were any other bracket, you would definitely move on. That means our number 11 seed, Obsession, moves on to the next round. And finally, we have our number 13 seed, Arkwright, versus our number 5 seed, 1775 Rebellion here, Anthony. A big war game or a super crunchy Euro? What do you got? I don't know. Who does this for <laughs> us? I don't want to do yeah. any more of these brackets. They're so hard. Stop making me choose things. I I don't know, man. Like we already kind of bumped Brass Birmingham, and I'm I'm like part of me just wants to have a game about the Industrial Revolution in here, and we don't really have one. I think it's important to this era, but at the same time, 1775 Rebellion, one of my favorite games, and the best implementation of the Birth of America series from Academy Games. We do already have a game with this system, 878 Vikings, in a different bracket, but this is like different enough thematically because you have not just the you know the Americans defending and the British and kind of coming to to, to move in and like the different ways that they recruit and the different ways that they spread out and like the neutral factions that kind of interact with both sides. It's really, really good. And it does such a good job of representing that era that you could easily use it as like a teaching tool, right? You can even get a teacher's guide to go with the game to use this in the classroom. And I, I think it would be great, especially in high school. Arkwright is a beast of a game, but it does a really good job, I feel like, of rep replicating what it's like to run those factories and, you know, the efficiency engine of trying to get the most out of the factories and buy back your stock and increase the stock value, but then you have to sell some to buy this. It's super heavy, though. I'm going to go with 1775 Rebellion because of the weight differential. I, I feel like Arkwright is just abstracted enough because it's so much going on that you end up focusing more on the numbers and the mechanics and the spreadsheet of it all than the actual theme that you're going through where 1775 rebellion you know if it if you could replace those cubes with little miniatures you might as well be you know playing a war game at that point and i think that's really cool. yeah this is a very very difficult pick and both games play tremendously the difficulty for me is arkwright never sees table time i want to play this game i, I want to get this game to the table it just never happens just because it's such an immensely crunchy, abstract type of experience where Academy Games is just known for just consistently putting out fantastic, historically accurate, so to speak, recreations, simulations of historical events. And it's fun. It's surprisingly fun. When I first sat down for 1775 Rebellion, I was like, yeah, I'm really not going to enjoy this. And I did. It's, it's very approachable. It teaches you something. And once again, there's a lot of additional content with the game that you can play in a number of different ways. So I'm going to go with our number five seed, 1775 Rebellion, moves on to the next round. All right, so we are back after much consternation and talking Anthony back into battling out in the brackets despite all of the tremendous, painful competitions that got on here. We're moving on to round three, my friend. So get ready. Here we are, Anthony. It only gets tougher from here on out. Our number one seed in our ancient bracket, Seven Wonders, versus our number 12 seed, the newcomer Hannibal and Hamakar with its new addition. What do you think here? Okay, here we go. <laughs> then it gets tough. Seven Wonders is significantly more accessible. You know, it, you can sit down and teach this game in five minutes and anybody can play it. It's very, very simple. But then there's so much depth you can add to it and all these expansions and different ways, things you can do. And, you know, you can throw some cards out and just see what happens or you can have a really tight strategy and kind of evolve over time. Hannibal and Hamilcar is not accessible. It is dense. It takes time to learn. It's not a full blown war game. It's a little simpler than that, but it is a little bit rougher to get into. 
but historically it's definitely has more depth to it. There's a lot more going on. So I'm kind of like torn between the two, which one's going to be better here representative. And I think I'm going to lean towards seven wonders just because more people are going to be able to play it and enjoy it and experience that. Whereas Hannibal and Hamilcar as a two player only game, that's decently heavy and hard to get into is really just preaching to the choir. The people are going to play this are the ones who already know the era and know these people and, you know, appreciate that for that, what it is. So I'm going to go with Seven Wonders. This is a really a difficult decision because the military practices and the historical era that it's trying to pick here, obviously getting a 20 year reprint is done for good reason. So Hannibal and Hanukkah does deserve to be here. And it does bring back some history that's probably been forgotten. Uh, Seven Wonders, you mentioned more accessible, but I think one of the things it does here that people overlook is the fact that it is bringing the seven wonders, which we take for granted. We're like, oh, yes, I know that board game. But you are getting to play those different wonder boards that represent historical technologies and wonders that we typically don't think about and getting to play that civilization. Now it's abstracted, more or less, but bringing the leaders and it really kind of solidifies things, maybe a little alternate universe, so to speak. But Seven Wonders, with its different eras and upgrading the technology, still kind of sticks with me. So that means our number one seed, Seven Wonders, moves on to the next round. Our next matchup in our ancient bracket is our number 10 seed, Innis, versus our number 11 seed, Command and Colors Ancients. Okay, Anthony, a lot of warring factions going on here. Which one works best for you? Yeah, I'm going to stay on the Innis train. Like, same thing I said, you know, for round two. It's just, it's unique, it's different, it's beautiful to look at. It's a different era than we typically talk about in terms of ancient civilizations. And it does it really, really well. And it's it's just, I mean, I love Command and Colors in any system. And Ancients is, you know, one of the best. But Innis is just a unique piece of work. And uh, absolutely like it. love it. Yeah, another big challenge as far as the warring factions are going i'm going to go with our number 11 seat here command and colors ancients just because i think historically they really go the extra step to make you feel like the battling that's going on here and the troops that are involved are more historically accurate and the artwork on the cards is fantastic so that means we have our first matchup tie in our ancient bracket going on to round four, Anthony, what do our listeners have to say? So the listeners on this one, and again, this is like an aggregate. We're adding up all votes total across all the brackets. Uh, but Innis walks away with this one. Uh, just a little bit more votes than Command. So that Power. means our number 10 seed, Innis, moves on to round four. Okay, so let's get on to our medieval bracket. The two big matchups here start off first with the Voyages of Marco Polo and the number four seed, A Feast for Odin, or like or what I like to call it, Sophie's Choice, Anthony. Which of your children do you love best? <laughs> all right. Last year, I trolled Feast for Odin all the way into the final four, maybe? <laughs> like, at least the final eight. I'm not going to do that this year, because I, I do agree. That's a bit abstract, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the trolling off. But um, uh, Voyages of Marco Polo, it has at least characters to it, you know, and it has location names on the map. So let's go. All right, that. Anthony. So thanks to your trolling off switch, I'm going to turn the trolling on switch again because I think our listeners should really have the final decision here. I'm going to go for Feast for Odin for all of the wacky, what? wacky <laughs> pieces that go on here. Because, you know, if you're going to feed a bunch of Vikings, you have to have the appropriately shaped food to fit on the table here. So let our listeners make the decisions here. And which of these games is going to be their choice? I feel this is disingenuous and you might just be mocking me. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> the listeners are on the side of justice here. I think they agree that the Voyages of Marco Polo has a little bit more historical context in it. That one got some more votes. All right. With just a pip difference here, the Voyages of Marco Polo rolls on to the next round. Our next matchup is our number 15 seed, the Cinderella team out of nowhere, 878 Vikings invading versus our number six seed, Twa. Battling out in this final bracket round, Anthony, what do you have to say about this one? Are you trolling us here or do you have a real game? <laughs> I only trolled one. It's only one. 
It's a tradition. I got to do it every year. Yeah, this one's a funny one. I almost feel like I misseeded 878 Vikings or I guess Board Game Geek did because that's what I used. All the reasons I said before, it's a brilliant game. It really represents that era really well. The mechanics perfectly represent kind of the historical mechanisms going on at the time. That system is just so good in terms of how it handles asymmetry and how the game ends up playing out. And it always plays out a little bit differently. And the way the, you know, the the balance kind of shifts as the game progresses, which is always a good sign of an asymmetrical game. And it represents how it flowed in history. So um, I'm going with the 15 and uh, 878 Viking. One of the things we don't typically talk about when we talk about thematic games is we don't talk about so much how games make us feel while we're playing them. And there is thematic feel towards a game. And when I play 878 Vikings and I'm playing against a single player or maybe even two other players and I'm playing the English and I'm trying to hold my country together and I'm holding my defense and I'm just almost sweating what they're going to play in their cards and how this invasion is going to hit me. And my heart rate is moving up. and I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm getting a little scared here. Where do I, you know put my forces it really does feel like i'm back in that era and i'm making these huge decisions so beyond the artwork beyond the historical context i feel like i am really defending here and i'm trying to save the whole aisle so i'm gonna go with our number 15 seed 878 vikings moves on to the next round all right anthony it's getting a little tight here let's get on to our next bracket here which I think is probably one of our favorite brackets here. This is our early modern period, and we are going to have first up our number nine seed. No one expected this to be here. Notre Dame versus our number five seed, Fresco. Okay, Anthony, a lot of great artwork and a lot of great time periods here. What do you have? Yeah, that's what's tough. I don't know. I feel like of the two, so if we're going to talk through like which one does it better, Notre Dame... We, we talked about the map, we talked about the plagues, which is an important part of this time period, period, right? Just people died left, mm-hmm. right, and sideways. <laughs> and all the creative ways they found to die. <laughs> Fresco is not about that at all. It's about all the creative, all the many different ways people found to be creative, which is another very defining part of this period. And I... Of the two, you know, if you're going to look at one versus the other, it's and they're both kind of abstract in their way because you have a Stefan Fell game on one side and the other one, you have a lot of cubes moving around. But even though Fresco is not one of my favorite games, I feel like it does a better job of opening up, looking at the theme, looking at what it was like to be, you know, an artist in that time period, create this masterwork that's going to be, you know, live on in history as so many people did, you know, in this 500 year period. 200 year period and so despite i think notre dame being in my opinion a better game at least more interesting mechanically and having some more interesting ideas going on there fresco does a better job of kind of evoking that time period so i'm gonna go with fresco yeah i think i'm gonna have to go with fresco as well it it is a difficult choice here because notre dame does feel like you are part of that era and you are dealing with the tragedy that they're dealing with at the time and trying to make the best choices possible So that means our number five seed, Fresco, with all its little bits and pieces, moves on to the next round. Next up, our number seven seed, Navigador, versus our number three seed, Lorenzo Il Manifico. Okay, Anthony, another challenging contest here. What do you think? Yeah, I really love that map in Navigador, but I I think this is the one. (laughs) This is the one where it loses out because Lorenzo is uh again it's it's very good at kind of evoking this is this individual this is the world that he lived in and this is how other people interacted with him and here's all the families of the time and the, the different individuals that you would interact with in those families and you know it's a euro so it's not thematic to those things but it does a lot to put those things in there and make you kind of work through it and read about it and evoke that time period whereas navigador does all that but a little more abstracted so i'm gonna go with lorenzo Yeah, this is another difficult matchup. Both fantastic games, especially getting to the table. (sighs) This is rough, but I'm going to go with Navigador. I think the map is something that maybe sets it apart a little bit. So, Anthony, that means our listeners are going to have the final say here. Is it going to be Navigador, our seven seed, or number three seed, Lorenzo Ilmanifico? What do they have to say? It is Lorenzo. All right, so that means our number three seed, Lorenzo Ilmanifico, moves on to the next round. 
Okay, this is our final bracket here. We are looking at the late modern period. There is so many great games, especially in this bracket here. I think we could just do a whole bracket just for this period. And a lot of upsets. Let's first talk about our number nine seed, Lewis and Clark. Facing down our number five seed, 1775 Rebellion. Oof, a lot of American history here. Yeah, went through this before. Lewis and Clark, you know, a subject I've spent a lot of time in my early life learning about and living and being able to see firsthand. And the game does a really good job of kind of bringing in those various pieces and showing them to you. 1775 Rebellion, brilliant system. One of the best ways to learn about and play through this particular set of battles and combat at that time. Uh, I still think Lewis and Clark, though, for me, is the more interesting and engaging historical game here. So I'm going to go with that one. Yeah, this is a really difficult choice. Both great games from American history. I would love to have these games actually back in my American history class. Ah, such a tough pick. You know what? I'm going to go with 1775 Rebellion just because Academy Games drop in some major history there. A little more appropriate for my taste. So, Anthony, it's going on to our listeners here. What do they have to say about American history? Yeah, this one was kind of close. Neither one of these had a ton, a ton of votes. I don't think a lot of people picked them to go too far. But Lewis and Clark had a little bit more. So that is the one that uh, is moving on. All right. So that means our number nine seed, Lewis and Clark, moves on to the next round. And our final matchup here is probably going to be one of our biggest matchups. Our number two seed, Lisboa facing off the newcomer on number 11 seed, the Cinderella team, the British royalty obsession. Anthony, can you possibly make a distinction here between the two? Mm, I don't know if I can. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. This is tough. I like of, of the four different regions that we had here. I think this one, the last four games here might be the toughest. All four of these were great and could any of them could easily win all of it, I think, because they're all really, really good at representing their periods. Ugh, Lisboa is just so darn good and so thematic, but Obsession is also so darn good and also so <laughs> thematic. So I think the tiebreaker for me, honestly, is going to be which is a better game mechanically, like which does a better job of injecting the mechanics as part of the, the that historical portion of the game. And I think... Mr. Lacerda is going to take it on that front because he's so darn good at it. But it's really razor close for me. Uh, I'm going to go with Lisboa, though. Yeah, I'm going to go Lisboa here. Obsession does a fantastic job representing that age and obviously what the families were doing, jockeying for power and prestige and reputation at the time. But Lisboa, you are physically building back the city that dealt with the earthquake, the fires and the floods. You actually have pieces that represent that you're dealing with obviously the red tape of politics and what the church was dealing with. So Lisboa, our number two seed, moves on to the final round. So that is everything for our big matchup here. We were looking at rounds two and three for March Gamer Man is best historic era. Please, absolutely, if you've been enjoying us, join us next week where we take on rounds five and six. It's only going to get even tougher for us. We'll have a lot more great content for you next week. We're going to talk about some great games and we will get on to our final winner. And so we really hope that you enjoyed this bracket competition as it goes on. But don't forget, all of our episodes are available. We do a bracket competition at least once a year. There are so many previous brackets you should jump back into. So maybe you like something a little lighter talking about different thematics and see which one of those battles that out. Or maybe you like to talk about is card games versus board games. Or maybe you like a bracket competition where it's about different types of components. We've done all those brackets over the past couple of years. So check us out on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. There are all those brackets there. Not to mention your favorite podcast player. You have to jump back a little bit, but it's there each and every March Madness. Thank you so much for joining us. We love to have you. Please give us some feedback on how you think those competitions are going or how wrong Anthony's been up so far in his terrible, terrible trolling here. One game. It was one game. <laughs> All right. So until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you a seat at the table. Listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at dicetowernetwork.com.